Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Glasgow, Kentucky. This is our fifth Sunday in the season of Lent, March 29th, 2020. We do welcome one and all to our worship service today. Just some behind the scenes information to bring to your attention. This service is actually being filmed a number of days before March 29th. We have heard today that the governor of Kentucky is going to release a new order which will further restrict mobility across the state. And so because of that, Chadwick, Morgan, and I decided to go ahead and film the service now while we're all here together. This is the reason for our more casual dress, our more casual service, but I bet you don't mind. My guess is, as you watch this at home on Sunday morning, you too are a bit more casual than usual, if I had to guess. But it reminds us anyway that God doesn't really care what we wear. It's what's in our hearts that matters the most. So we do welcome one and all to First Presbyterian Church, this worship service, our fifth Sunday in Lent. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. We do have a special service planned for Palm Sunday, including some special music. So please join us next Sunday for our Palm Sunday celebration. During the week, we will also continue our book study, which we've called Soup, Sandwich, and Study, minus the soup and the sandwich for the time being. If you're in that group, you know uh, you'll get a message from me about meeting time on Wednesday. So just be aware that that will continue but we will do so through electronic and online means. Other announcements to call to your attention, um, please contact me or the church office if you need anything. I will be available and am available to help with anything that comes up. And so with that in mind, just know we're here for you still during this time of uh, social distancing. And with all that in mind, please join me now as we worship God together this morning. Friends, as we come to our prayer time this morning, I do, these days especially, encourage you in your own personal lives to pray for one another, 
pray for your friends and family, pray for this community and even those globally which have been affected by social distancing and by the coronavirus. These are trying times for all of us. There's a lot of anxiety out there. So please, of all times, this is our time to be a person of prayer and to do so as a duty to one another and to do so before God. We come to our prayer time. I want to uh, give you some updates for your prayer time in your homes. Our prayer list remains the same. We will include in our prayers today, as we did last week, all those affected by the social distancing, by the attempts to slow down the coronavirus that has a cost to many people. We'll pray for them. Also, I want to share some joys. Every uh, week we lift up our birthdays. I, we have a number of birthdays this week, so I want to mention those celebrations we have. Today, March 29th, is Max's birthday. Happy birthday, Max. 14 years old today. We celebrate that birthday today. Tuesday, the 31st, we have two birthdays to celebrate. Nancy and Heather both will have birthdays on the 31st. This one I'll never forget because it's April Fool's Day. Uh, April 1st, Nick has his 14th birthday. So on Wednesday, uh, happy birthday, Nick, to you on your 14th. On April 3rd, Friday, uh, Betty Carroll has a birthday. And on Saturday is my birthday, April 4th. So uh, we celebrate and lift up these joys. Also in our prayer time, I do want to give a special word of um, thanksgiving to our leadership team here at this church. They have done so much work, extra work. I want to thank the four of them. I, I want to thank Jackson, who has been part of planning these services and has been doing a great job in contacting many of our youth members. I want to thank Leisha for her work in keeping the office running so well during this time. I want to thank Morgan, who has become our IT person by default. He records these services and uploads them for us. Thank you. And to thank Chadwick as well, who uh, this past week has been uh, on the clock as early as 7 a.m. and as late as 10 p.m. So I do want to thank, and we all thank, our leadership team for getting us through this time in particular. So with all that, please join me now in prayer, and we'll end our prayer time with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you today that we can gather as a church still. Though we're not in person, we're not side by side, all of us, we're still together in spirit. Your Holy Spirit that resides within us unites us together one by one. And even though we may be at distant places from one another, this is a great reminder to us that the church is so much more than just the building. The church is the people inside of it. We're grateful today for this church family. We're grateful today for those that are visiting our church by viewing this service. We give you thanks that you're here with us in our homes, in this building, and wherever we choose to view, whenever we choose to view this service, we know that you will be present. And Lord God, we need your presence especially. This day and age, this time of great need, there are so many that are among us in this community that are in much distress. We pray for our neighbors, our friends. We pray for our own livelihoods, our own families. We're all affected by the anxiety of the day. We all need your help. We ask specifically that you be with our prayer list. We pray for Eleanor and for Georgia Lou and for Linda and for Lou May. And we give thanks for the recoveries from surgery for Bryce and Sandra. The concerns we have in our hearts that we give to you in silence, we know that you hear those as well. We thank you for being our comfort during this time. You have a peace that, that no one can take from us. 
and we lean on that right now. And Lord God, despite the difficulties of the day, we also are people of joy. We celebrate the milestones of life. We give you thanks today for our birthdays. There are so many, and we celebrate with each of them. We also thank you today for the leadership of this church, the people you've called together to be here at this place and at this time to be of help to this church family. We thank you for them. But today, as always, we thank you most of all for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, for his friendship to us, for his example to us, and for teaching us how to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we come now to our time of reading the scriptures. I'm going to go ahead and let you know what it is now so you can find it in your home Bible. In your home Bible, turn now or start looking for it as I'll start looking for it in the Pew Bible here. Uh, please go with me to John's Gospel. We're going to John chapter 11. And as you look for that and find that, I want to talk a minute before we read the scriptures about friends. During this time, especially in our lives, friends are more important than ever before. Our friends are the ones we turn to, to celebrate with, to laugh with, to share uh, great times with. And our friends are also the ones we turn to, to help us in times of difficulty, in times of great need. I read somewhere recently, this past week, that some friends are with us for a reason. Some friends are with us for a season. A few friends are with us for a lifetime. They all are important to us. The same was true for Jesus in his day. Jesus had some very, very dear friends, friends to him and friends that he were, was friends to. And today we're going to read about three dear friends of Jesus, Mary Martha, and Lazarus. John chapter 11. Please join me there. We'll read through, we'll skip part of it, read through most of it, and talk about it, and get a lesson today from Jesus. John chapter 11. Join me now. We'll start at verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, 
whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness is not unto death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by means of it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Let's pause there just for a moment. Here we get introduced to three good friends of Jesus, two sisters and a brother, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Very good friends. In fact, we read that Jesus loved them. They were very, very close to one another. And Lazarus, the good friend of Jesus whom he loved, was very ill. Let's read some more. Now, but skip down, please. Skip down to verse 7. Verse 7. Then after he said this to the disciples, Let us go into Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were but now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Okay, now skip to verse 11, please. 11. Thus Jesus spoke, and then Jesus said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awake him out of sleep. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. All right, let's pause there for a moment, please. Lazarus, the dear friend of Jesus, has died, but Jesus already knows that a miracle will happen. Lazarus is dead. Jesus knows it's going to be okay, though, and they continue forth to go see Mary and Martha, and here's what happens when they arrive. Skip down, please, to verse 20. Verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary sat in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying quietly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Please pause, pause for one minute. So Martha meets Jesus and Martha is giving Jesus um, the grief and the sadness that she's feeling, right? Jesus is her friend, and so she's explaining to Jesus and showing him and demonstrating this sadness of heart that she has. And Jesus is trying to say to Martha, you know, it's going to be okay, but Martha is so grief-stricken, she's not listening to that. She is really troubled by Lazarus' death. She goes to get her sister Mary, and then next happens this, verse 30. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Then Mary, when she came where Jesus was and saw him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled, and he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And let's please, please pause there. So now Jesus is with Martha and with Mary. Both are grieving, and the crowd of people with Martha uh, Martha and Mary, they also are all grieving. And Jesus 
picks up on this and is very empathetic here. He, he, he is distressed by their grief. Now, he knows already it's going to be okay, but he's still moved by their grief. He, he doesn't want to see them. It saddens him to see them in this grief, and he feels it too, even though he knows it's going to be all right. It sort of reminds me, um, as a parent, parents, you'll, uh, uh, you'll have experienced this too, when our children are two or three years old or four years old, when they go outside to play and they fall and skin their knee and they come inside the house crying, or they uh, jam their finger into a cabinet or door and, and, and hurt their finger, they come crying. We know as parents, in five minutes they're going to be fine. In five minutes they'll be playing again outside. But the kid in that moment who has skinned their knee or smashed their finger, they don't know if they'll be uh, all right or if they'll have to amputate their leg or finger off, right? They're, they're crying, they're in pain. And even though as parents we know it's going to be okay, we still hate to see them crying like that. We, we empathize with our children when they're hurt, even if it's just for a few minutes. We say things like, oh, poor guy or poor girl. Jesus the same way. He knows it'll be okay, and, but he empathizes with Mary and Martha and all those around him, sharing their grief. And now the next three verses, 35. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And we'll come back to those three verses here in a minute. Let's finish out the passage. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that you would see, that you would, um, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I knew that thou hearest me always, but I have said this on account of the people standing by, that they may believe that thou didst send me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with bandages, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Jesus also tells us elsewhere that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The passage we read contains a very famous verse because it's the shortest verse in all the Bible. It's verse 35. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Even though it's a very short verse, it's a very important lesson to us today, these days especially. The same way that Jesus grieved alongside Mary and Martha and all the others, the way that he felt, not just understood what they were going through, felt what they were going through, is an example to us today. Because in our community around us, there are so many people like Mary and Martha, who are grieving right now, who are facing hardships right now, who are going through difficult times right now. And now is our chance to be like Jesus to them, to go there and to empathize with them, to share in their grief, to weep with them, to pray with them, to help them if we can. I was thinking about the people just around the block of the church who right now are grieving and are weeping and are having difficulties. If I go outside our door across from the fire station on normal weeks during this time, I would look down the street and see a lot of cars parked outside Little Taste of Texas. Well, there's no cars parked there today. And all the people that worked there, that made a living there, that cared for their families by their jobs there, by being servers and such, they're not getting paid right now. They're grieving, and they need a community to embrace them, as Jesus did Mary and Martha, to lift them up, 
And if I go out the front door of the sanctuary, I will see Crow Funeral Home. Most normal weeks, the parking lot is full a few times a week. The parking lot has been empty there for two weeks. And because of social distancing, the people that so want to express condolences to family and friends can't do so. And those who desperately need to receive condolences can't receive it. There are people around us grieving and weeping. And like Jesus, we're the ones called to weep with them, to grieve with them, to pray for them, to help them. And outside my office window, I have a great view of the bank next to the building here. Normal weeks, there's a lot of activity of people walking in and out of the bank. Businesses taking their deposits to the bank. Well, the deposits are not near what they were last month, and the activity has really slowed down. Just in the block around the church building, there are so many people that I see and observe that are grieving, so much like Mary and Martha. They need someone like Jesus to be with them, to help them during this time. And that's the call that we receive from the gospel today. May we be the ones who weep with others. May we be the ones that find our neighbors that need help and help them if we can. May we be the ones that go to those that are having difficulties and to pray with them and for them. We're the ones doing the work of the gospel this day and age, and that's our call right now. And the good thing about that is we don't have to do it alone. We'll have plenty of help. Verse in the scripture after Jesus wept says this. So the Jews said, see how he loved him, right? There were those in the crowd with Jesus that also were there for Mary and for Martha to console them, to, to pray for them, to be there for them, to help them. Jesus didn't have to do it alone. There were many other people there also helping, helping out Mary and Martha. And as we go into our communities and find people around us that are in need, we'll have help as well. There are many other people that want to help their neighbors, that want to pray for other people. If you find somebody in need, take somebody with you. There's plenty to choose from, believe me. And one of the beautiful things that I really appreciate about the Presbyterian Church is this. Uh, and this goes way back, even it goes back to John Calvin, actually, in the 1500s. And that's the concept and the belief that every person that walks this earth and breathes is a beloved child of God. And our response to every person, regardless, is to love them. That's what we're called to do. And that's why in the Presbyterian Church, we always place a lot of emphasis on working together with other people for the common good. We work, of course, with our fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ in an ecumenical fashion. We do that all the time. But also as the Presbyterian Church, we seek out and have always sought dialogue and discussion and relationships with people of other faiths. And in times like this, we can count on their help to be in dialogue with us, to help us meet the needs of this day. This is not a problem of Christianity we face. It's a problem of humanity. And we all together have many people to pull from to help our neighbors in need. So as you go forth and find your neighbor that needs help, you have others that will go with you and that will help you do that. Let's seek them out and come together and support one another. But also, I, I have to say that, yes, there are people who will help us. There's also many people that won't. There are many people that during these times have demonstrated themselves to be um, more selfish, uh, more of the looking out for number one. We all have seen stories of people hoarding things, people who take a year's supply of an item to the detriment of others that need a day supply of the same thing. We've all 
seeing stories about that. And I'll tell you, um, hoarding is an experience that, that I saw, I'll share with you, two weeks ago when all of this anxiety really came to the forefront. I went to my local grocery store, which is Meyer in Bowling Green, uh, Meyer Grocery. I go there once a week. It's close to my house. So I go two weeks ago to get our grocery list, and I pull into the parking lot, and it's the fullest I've ever seen it. And I thought, well, what's on sale today? It must be a big sale. But it wasn't a sale. As I walked into the store, people were pushing out shopping carts full of nothing but bottled water or full of nothing but uh, paper towels and bathroom tissue, right? And as I went into the store and got a cart, I was surprised. I really was that there was no milk, none. Uh, there was no, of course, paper towels, bathroom tissue, that whole aisle empty, completely empty. Sanitizer, uh, Lysol wipe, spray, gone. And on my list was sour cream. I thought, well, surely the goodness there's sour cream left. No, that was gone. And I'm thinking, who's buying all the sour cream? And I decided right then and there, I could live on beans and cornbread for a month if I have to. So I went to buy some dried beans, and they were all gone. And no rice, no bread. And the kids liked chicken nuggets in the frozen section. They were gone. It was amazing. But the, the hoarder in me sort of kicked in when I went down the ice cream aisle. And one of the things I really like are Klondike bars, not just the regular Klondike, but the Heath Klondike. And as I went down the ice cream aisle, I saw there was only one left in the freezer. And the switch went off in my head, and I said, I'm getting that for me, right? And I got that last pack of the Klondike Heath. I had to push two people down to get it, but I got it, right? And so, uh, that reminded me, though, that it's a bit of human nature within us to be hoarders. And so when we come across people that are doing that to the detriment of others, I know a lot of people around us are shaming them or putting extra guilt on them. I encourage us as a church family, though, to not do that. We're not in the business of giving guilt to people. We're in the business of taking guilt away. But just realize and know, though, that there are people who are not looking out for the needs of others. Same way in the passage we just read, right? Jesus wept, remember? And some said, see how he loved him. They were helpers. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying, right? There were the scoffers there, too. There were those in that crowd that didn't want to help. They just wanted to poke fun at Jesus. In the same way as we do the work of Jesus Christ in our communities, as we weep with other people and bring others with us to help, there's going to be some that want no part of it. Just be aware of it. We don't judge them. Just be aware that not everyone is on board with helping their neighbors. So all that just goes to say, and we get it from our gospel lesson here, and that, that as we go into the world, as we leave our homes, the limited amount that we do, as we interact with our family and neighbors the best way that we can, pay attention to those around you. Who is it that's grieving right now? Who is it that needs help? Who is it that's weeping? Who is it that's struggling? May we be the one, like Jesus, to weep with them, to grieve with them, to struggle with them, to pray with them. Bring others with you. There's many who want to help. Yes, friends, many years ago, Jesus went to help his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He was there. He felt their grief. He comforted them. He brought Lazarus back. He performed a miracle. Those were his friends. Today, we as well do the same. Go forth today. Be that friend to others. Grieve with them. 
weep with them, pray with them, help them. So many people around us, this church building, even this block, need that help. Find them. Be Jesus Christ in the world today. Be Jesus Christ to your friends and neighbors. If we do that, my friends, indeed, we too will have been, have been people that have heard the gospel call and have wept with those that are weeping. Amen.
final note that I'll say as our service concludes involves offerings. Normally, we would pass the collection plate as churches do. We depend so much upon the generosity of the people of God to keep this ministry going and active. I'm not the treasurer. I don't see the numbers uh, of what people give, nor should I. But I do know and get a sense that our expenses are a bit more than usual during this time because we have to do new things and get the word out in new ways. I encourage you, please, to write down the address of this church, if you haven't already, to get a pen and a piece of paper, 200 East Washington Street, Glasgow, Kentucky, 42141. If you can support this church with a check, it is greatly needed and appreciated. I'll also say that we are in the process of, of uh, accepting online contributions. We're not there just yet. We have begun the process. It is underway. Soon we will be able to accept online offerings. When that is available, it will be posted to our website. Maybe by the time you see this video, it will be posted uh, there as well. But no, we are working to get that up and going. As we go into the world, there is so much need. We can't, um, we can't help the whole world. It's just too much for one person to do. But collectively, we can do so much more than we think. Let's go forth today, once again, support the ministry of this church with what you can, support your neighbors with what you can, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and always.